This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So that was a very wonderful uh, uh, amalgam of the basic science of stress biology. Now we're going to hear about the empiric data and the, uh, uh, what happens uh, at the level of the baby. So Dr. Barbara Abrams is our colleague over at uh, the Department of Nutrition and Public Health over at UC Berkeley. She is a nutritional epidemiologist who has spent her career investigating the out, uh, neonatal outcomes based on uh, uh, changes in pregnancy and uh, the role of the healthcare system in fomenting that. So with that, Barbara, thank you. Well, this has been a really fun conference for me. And I want to thank the previous speakers for setting up my talk. Um, I'm uh, going to be talking about some up-to-date findings that of a study we're doing trying to investigate how stressful maternal childhood might contribute to maternal and child obesity. So as we've heard, maternal obesity uh, is a very, very common problem today. And it has really important implications. And I think this quote from a recent report published in the United Kingdom really summarizes what we're up against. Obesity is arguably the biggest challenge facing maternity services today. It is a challenge not only because of the magnitude of the problem, but also because of the impact that obesity has on women's reproductive health and that of their babies, and I would add their children, and perhaps even those children when they become adults. So currently we are facing a very major problem in pre-pregnancy obesity. Almost half of, in addition to the high number of women who begin pregnancy with a BMI over 30 and even with a BMI over 40, um, almost half of US women gain more than recommend, recommended during pregnancy uh, based on the 2009 Institute of Medicine recommendations for their pre-pregnancy BMI. So we not only have people starting pregnancy obese, but then we have people who may not be obese starting pregnancy and gaining so much weight that they become obese, which is not only a problem during their pregnancy, but le if they don't lose the weight, which just, I don't know what Dr. Catalano did with those ladies to have them return to their pre-pregnancy weight, but it's not easy uh, in our environment for women to do that. Um, I'm sure that he knows how, and he'll tell us. Um, but uh, so it's not just pre-pregnancy BMI we need to worry about. It may also be gestational weight gain. There have been uh, lots of investment in trials to help women manage their weight gain in pregnancy. And within the last decade, I'd say it's just, you could say it is unbelievable increase of funded trials, not only in the US, but all around the world. Um, unfortunately, while some trials have reported statistically significant differences, um, and I think we may hear about this afternoon, Fit for Delivery, which I was really privileged to work with Suzanne Phelan on, um, there is inconsistent evidence. And um, I think I heard Barbara tell me yesterday that you, Kim, have said there's something like 26 trials that have been reviewed in something like 17 systematic review and meta-analyses, and they've reached every conclusion you can imagine. <laughs> there is an effective intervention, there isn't an effective intervention, isn't an effective intervention, and um, we don't know because the data aren't good enough to even figure out. So we um, aren't there yet to actually know what to do with all this information about how, how difficult weight is uh, before and during pregnancy. We don't know how to intervene. So um, basically, I have, have been working on this my whole life, and there's this woman in my mind that I, she goes everywhere with me in my mind, and she was a pregnant woman at UCSF who sat in my office crying, not just through one pregnancy, but two. Uh, she knew what she needed to do to manage her health, 
but she just would say, I can't. And I wondered then why she couldn't, but I was kind of overwhelmed by everybody else I was taking care of at that time. But um, in the last couple of years, as the evidence has grown about stress and getting under the skin and the importance of the life course, this woman comes to my mind all the time. And um, I decided that maybe it was important to look well before pregnancy. I mean, we think we're doing really well if we can get to preconceptional care, but what if the real effects are happening way earlier and they're invisible. We can't actually see them. So if we, you know, we, what if that happened? Um, we know that uh, the fetus and young child may be especially vulnerable to permanent changes in the nervous system and in their physiology, as we've heard today, as a result of experiencing trauma or stress, not just poor diet, not just chemicals in the environment. So today I'm gonna to talk about the possibility that maternal ACE, which stands for Adverse Childhood Experience, might increase maternal obesity before and during pregnancy, as well as obesity in the offspring of the mother. Now, if adverse childhood experience is a risk factor for maternal and child obesity, treating childhood trauma in women before or during pregnancy, or treating childhood trauma anytime, you know, as soon as possible, um, might have the potential for reducing maternal and child obesity. And so when, in this talk, I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit why even think about this question uh, as a background. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we find looking at pre-pregnancy weight and gestational weight gain as risk factors for maternal and child outcomes in the data set that I'm working in. Um, then I'm going to talk about our new data about linking maternal uh, ACE with maternal weight before and during pregnancy. And then I'm going to conclude by telling you what we found in terms of is maternal ACE a risk factor for child obesity. So obviously we know child obesity is a major problem. Uh, minority children are especially impacted. And at first glance, and where a lot of the money has been flowing, we think about the child in front of us. So we think about their genes, we think about the environment in which they're living, we think about their behaviors, and we think about early life, as we've heard, or fast growth, breastfeeding, sleep, things like that. But as we've heard very well this morning, things are happening way sooner than that child in front of us. Um, we know that the gestational milieu in which the fetus grow may create a physiological predisposition for um, obesity that can emerge throughout the life course. So here's the slide that Bob promised you I would show you. This is one of my very favorite images. Uh, it's an example of epigenetics, and the only difference between these two genetically identical cloned agouti mice is what their mothers ate during pregnancy. The brown mouse, mother received a diet with supplements that turned off the gene that usually would create the gold coat and the high weight of the, um, of the gold mouse. And even though after birth, these, mouse, these mice were fed identically, the gold mouse was fat and the brown mouse rela remained lean and conferred, that leanness conferred better health throughout the entire life course. So that lady in my head and those mice are kind of my companions on the path of my work. <laughs> so um, we know, as we've just heard, that birth weight is um, a very important mediator between um, the prenatal environment and child obesity. And um, we know that some of the factors in the prenatal environment that are related to birth weight um, include stress, smoking, diet during pregnancy, uh, gestational diabetes, as we've well heard, maternal obesity at the beginning of pregnancy, and the mom's weight gain during pregnancy, especially excessive gestational weight gain. And in this talk, I'll be only focusing on maternal weight as the outcomes I'm, I'm uh, discussing, pre-pregnancy obesity and excessive gestational weight gain. So how might a mother's early childhood experience operate in this relationship? So the um, adverse childhood experience scale was first developed about 20 years ago by two physicians at Kaiser Permanente in San Diego in conjunction with the CDC. Uh, their names are Vincent Folletti and Robert Anda. And they studied 17,000 Kaiser adults and linked a high ACE score to a wide variety of mental and physical outcomes. Among this mostly college-educated Kaiser population, 64% 
reported at least exposure to at least one ACE, and 12% reported exposure to four or more ACEs. So there's been a growing literature in the epidemiology since this Kaiser study, and of course, psychology, the field of psychology has known about this for a long time, and when I talk to psychologists, they go, what's the new thing here exactly? But for epidemiology, it's actually opened up a whole field, um, looking at it in bigger numbers, slightly differently, probably not as well, personally, I think, but we do our best. Um, so this growing literature has um, linked ACE with pretty much almost everything in adult health. Um, and it also suggests that as the number of ACEs increase, health in adulthood deteriorates. So what are the ACE exposures? Um, well, it includes abuse before the age, eight. all of these are before the age of 18. Emotional, physical, or sexual abuse. It includes emotional or physical neglect. And it includes living in a home with household dysfunction. So living in a home with alcoholism, substance abuse, uh, mental illness, family members who are in prison, witnessing domestic violence, witnessing the death of a parent, and divorce. So thinking back to that woman, and um, I don't know why she couldn't, but I do know something was off in her development, that she did not feel empowered in her own body to take care of herself. Um, I would hypothesize that any of these exposures could be underlying her lack of self-efficacy. Um, so just to give you a sense of the kinds of uh, prevalences of ACE that have been uh, reported in the literature, CDC um, is now using an 11 item ACE scale in their BRFSS uh, survey that they do in 14 states and the District of Columbia, or at least they did in 2009, 2010. The data I'm showing you here, it just happened to be a pretty slide, are for the state of Minnesota, but they almost identically mirror national data that I found in a recent study of all the states and District of Columbia. So you can see verbal abuse is the most common at 28%, that's almost one in three. Um, Drinking in the home, a problem for 24%. Mental illness, 17%. Physical abuse, 16%. And uh, sexual abuse, 10% overall. So how might this operate? So I'm going to show you a pyramid from the CDC that hypothesized the mechanism that might explain the link between ACE and long-term health. Starting with the, the actual experience a child would have, which would de then disrupt their neurodevelopment which then would impair their social, cognitive, and emotional development and ability to function in the world. As a, as a co compensatory mechanism, we heard ad adaptation. The organism wants to adapt. Um, perhaps they would adapt by using alcohol, smoking cigarettes, using drugs, or overeating, comfort eating. Um, in fact, Felitti says that he ask the ACE question from the very beginning because he worked in an obesity clinic. And when, when, and when people said they were gaining weight back and he didn't understand why they kept gaining the weight back, he learned that some of the women had been sexually abused and they wanted the weight between them and the world. And that got him thinking about something that had happened a long time ago that was now impacting the um, care of the, his patients. And that is one of the reasons why he asked the question. Um, we know that women with ACE, um, People with ACE have more eating disorders, have more comfort eating. Um, there's a recent study using the Yale addi Food Addictions uh, Scale that found that uh, ACE is associated with food addiction. That leads to disease, disability, and social problems, and ultimately, perhaps, an early death. So um, this model on the CDC website did not bring up the concept of biological program and epigenetic changes, so I added it to the, uh, to the pyramid. Um, and it, we've heard all the different mechanisms in the talks we've just heard that might underlie hormonal mechanisms, um, uh, various nutritional stresses, um, the plastic system really can be influenced at the neurobiological, endocrine, and immune level that would affect development of and um, appetite and feeding behaviors, stress-related uh, food reward dependence, and a variety of metabolic aberrations. So this graphic, um, I think it's very compelling. It was designed by somebody named Elena Quintera, who's the executive director of the Institute of Public Safety and Social Justice at the Adler School of Professional Psychology in Chicago. 
Using data from the original ACE study, Kaiser study, she created this pie chart and she put in all these different outcomes that were associated with ACE in that study. And then she put this gray area which had the prevalence of people with each of those outcomes who reported having an ACE experience and she called this an oil slick of ACEs. And she says, if you are able to prevent adverse childhood experiences, it's like putting a giant sponge in the middle of this oil slick and sucking it up all at once. It's compelling. Of course, we know that this is based on just observational data and the prevalence of ACE, and we have absolutely no idea if we could suck up all of that disease if we dealt with ACE, but actually we should deal with ACE anyway. <laughs> Even if it didn't cause disease, we ought to deal with it. Um, so ACE has been associated with a lot of different outcomes. The data, um, you know, the data are inconsistent in many cases. We really don't know 100% what is actually going on here, but it's very compelling to continue to work on that. And a recent meta-analysis um, out of the UK looked at all the studies up to that point and found that um, ACE does increase obesity um, in their interpretation. So we believe it is possible that maternal ACE might affect obesity in pregnant women and their offspring through embedded stress in the mom, and that that embedded stress may drive behaviors that then affect the health of the mother and her child. So here are the questions um, that I'm going to quickly answer. Is maternal weight associated with health outcomes? Is exposure to childhood adversity associated with maternal pre-pregnancy obesity and excessive gestational weight gain? Is maternal exposure to childhood obesity associated with her child's obesity, childhood adversity associated with her child's obesity, and do these findings vary by race ethnicity? So the data set that I'm working with is the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth. Uh, this is a large U.S. cohort study that, was, uh, that is sponsored by the National Bureau of Labor Statistics, and it's an ongoing survey that gathers information at multiple points of time with the goal of really understanding labor market activities and other significant life events of men and women in the U.S. It serves as an important tool for economists, sociologists, social scientists, psychologists, and other resources researchers and has been the source of more than 4,000 publications and reports. It's a prospective cohort with an intergenerational component. It's nationally representative and it oversampled black and Hispanics to allow a better understanding of minority health. Um, so as I said, it is a prospective study with an intergenerational component and mothers, the people were born, I'm only talking about moms today, the people were born in 1959 to 1964. They were recruited and enrolled in the study in 1979, and then every year or two ever since, they have been followed. They're in the, they're actually just, yeah, just came out of the field um, in, their, in the most recent um, cohort. Um, in 1986, they realized the moms, the women were having babies, and so NICHD gave them money to create a birth cohort. And that birth cohort worked backwards to recall information about the babies born before and prospectively for the babies born after. There's currently been uh, 24 waves. We're in the 25th. And 80% um, of the original participants who were not intentionally dropped or died have remained in the study. They've collected repeated measures on, on weight and height, um, pregnancy course and outcome, including gestational weight gain, child weight, height, and health, and a variety, wide variety, of social, economic, and demographic data. We have over 100,000 variables that we could work with. However, just to be clear, it's all self-reported. Okay, so. so I'm gonna show you some of the outcomes that we have reported associated with maternal obesity and excessive gestational weight gain really quickly, just to give you a sense of the data that we're working on. So first of all, this data set, um, includes women who, um, who were before the obesity epidemic and through the obesity epidemic. So only 8% of the women were obese at their first pregnancy, and this is much lower than current. Uh, we still had plenty of excessive gestational weight gain, however, in the NLSY, 40% of women gained excessively. Um, interestingly, 30% of women gained inadequately because this time crossed over when weight gain was in pregnancy was discouraged. So here's an overview of the outcomes we have reported on, large for gestational age, child overweight, um, early menarche in daughters, postpartum weight retention in the mom, and midlife obesity at age 40. 
And so our exposures, I'm gonna just talk about them together because the results are similar. Uh, Pre-pregnancy obesity and excessive gestational weight gain according to the IOM. We found it's associated with large for gestational age, it's associated with childhood obesity, it's associated with postpartum weight retention, it's associated with early age of menarche in the daughters of the NLSY moms, and it's associated with maternal obesity at age 40. So our next question is whether a maternal report of ACE exposures is associated with pre-pregnancy obesity and excessive gestational weight gain in the NLSY moms. In, um, my R01 raised money so that NIH would fund the additional of these ACE, ACE measurements to the 2012 round of data collection for the NLSY survey. So um, due to time limitations, we were only allowed to ask three questions. We actually asked four. Um, BLS would not consider us measuring sexual abuse either. So we, sat, we had these um, ACE questions and we circulated them to a bunch of experts on child development and some of which are in the room. And we asked people to rank the ones they thought were the most important and we chose those to use. So we only asked three questions. Um, we also have included a question about love and affection, but I'm not going to be presenting that data today. So here are our questions. When I say ACE, this is what I'm talking about. Before age 18, did you live in a home where there was mental illness or suicide? Before age 18, did you live in a home with problem drinking or alcoholic? And how often did a parent or adult in your home uh, physically abuse you? And it, the data were never once or more than once. So here's some of the characteristics um, in waiting, weighted frequencies from our diverse population. Um, it, the data set is 78% uh, white, 15% black, and 7% Hispanic. This is the mother's mother's education. We're looking at ACE, early childhood, so we wanted to look at socioeconomic um, exposure at that, at, or in early life, and we really don't have perfect data, but you can see the um, only 19% of, of the mothers in our study had a high school education, I mean, more than a high school education, which I think probably reflects the timing of our data. And here are our prevalence of ACE data. 17% of the women reported being physically abused in, as a child. 23% reported alcoholism in their, phone, in their family or alcohol problems. And 11% reported mental illness in their homes. And um, the two, first two are very consistent with national data, but our NLSY moms report less mental illness than nationally. This slide pers uh, displays the percentages as weighted frequencies for each of the three ACE exposures by race ethnicity. And at the top, you see the overall for the sample. And then um, you can see that black women report less ACE overall. And um, Hispanic mothers reported more physical abuse. And white mothers reported more alcohol abuse and mental illness in the family. And then in terms of pre-pregnancy BMI, uh, ACE was higher, both in obese women and in women with excessive gestational weight gain. So here's our actual finding. It's the results of a multivariable model, series of them, examining associations between ACE exposure and pre-pregnancy BMI of greater than 30. Physical abuse and alcohol abuse in the family were each associated with elevated adjusted odds ratios for pre-pregnancy obesity, and there was also synergy, so that women exposed to both physical and alcohol abuse in their childhood were at st statistically significantly higher odds of pre-pregnancy obesity than just one or none. Um, mental illness in the family was not significantly related to pre-pregnancy obesity. And um, this result that we found is consistent with the only study that we've identified already published in the literature. And this was a study of 239 women attending an antenatal care program in a tertiary hospital in Australia. And they used a different uh, questionnaire, the Childhood Trauma Questionnaire, which actually covered more types of abuse emotional, physical, sexual abuse, and neglect as well. After help adjusting for covariates, they did find a doubled odds of, um, of ACE um, association with, um, with uh, pre-pregnancy obesity. Um, we did note that if they asked yes, no, they didn't find an association. And our data are more like yes, no. Now here's the association between ACE and excessive gestational weight gain. And again, we have elevated odds of excessive gestational weight gain with physical abuse and alcohol problems in the family. And again, 
um, stronger with both, and again, no association with mental illness. Um, and this association was similar when we did a sensitivity analysis that adjusted for pre-pregnancy BMI, suggesting pathways between ACE and, GW, and gestational weight gain that are beyond maternal obesity. So in summary, our models suggest that exposure to physical abuse and alcohol are each modestly but independently associated with maternal obesity and excessive gestational weight gain, and the combination of the two yielded a significantly higher risk of each of these outcomes. We found no evidence of differences by race, ethnicity in this, these analyses. So our final question looks at whether maternal childhood adversity affects offspring obesity. For this analysis, we used more than 8,000 NLSY offspring born to almost 4,000 mothers. Analyses were stratified by age, race, and gender of the child, but here I will only show the data for teenagers. It is similar for three and seven-year-olds. Obesity was defined as a BMI of greater than the 95th percentile for sex and age using CDC growth standards, and we estimated adjusted population attributable risks based on logistic regression models, adjusting for early life so socioeconomic status. Um, so um, first, we wanted to see, do, did maternal ACE exposure vary by the child race, age, uh, race and gender? And basically, our findings suggested that gender didn't matter, but race did. And it was pretty similar to what I already showed you in the previous slide. As previously shown, black mothers reported less ACE than other mothers, and white mothers reported higher prevalence of ACE, particularly for home dysfunction. This slide shows you the prevalence of obesity in the cohort. Um, and it ranged from a low of 11% in females to 21% in black females. At white females to 21% in black females, and pretty much looks quite similar to the US uh, child obesity um, uh, in terms of race ethnicity differences. Um, it, it was highest at 19% of Hispanic males, but 18% of white males and 17% of black males, it wasn't so different. So this displays the results of our models, and um, the um, question is, is the prevalence of each of the maternal ACE exposure by child's gender and race ethnicity, um, is it changing the, um, the risk of child obesity? The x-axis goes from minus 2 to 4% change in obesity prevalence. And if you look at the dotted line, if the confidence intervals cross that dotted line, there's no change. We found absolutely no evidence that ACE is associated with child obesity. No matter how we looked, I, can, I think we did 170 models, which we knew then we could never get a, if we got a p-value, we couldn't use it. But we wanted to beat this to death, and we did. And we can't find anything. In contrast, a recent study from Harvard um, using the Nurses Health Study and their uh, Growing Up Together study did report an association between a combined measure of maternal maltreatment and child overweight in almost 17,000 children. They found an adjusted odds ratio of 1.21, comparing the mothers who reported severe obese, uh, abuse compared to those who reported no abuse. And um, I think this is something to pay attention to, which is our measure of ACE is very, very nonspecific. Um, and their measures of uh, child adversity were much more specific, as was the Australian study. So in summary, in our data in the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, um, maternal obesity and excessive gestational weight gain are associated with a wide variety of health outcomes across the life course for both mother and child. ACE was commonly reported by the mothers, and the prevalence was rather consistent with other samples. ACE was associated with both pre-pregnancy obesity and excessive gestational weight gain, but not associated with childhood obesity. Now, we had some limitations we want to talk about. Um, first of all, as I said, our measures of ACE are not comprehensive. We do not have severity, for example, and we're missing some really important ACEs, such as sexual abuse for girls, or sexual abuse period. ACE is a self-reported variable, and in this case, was reported after the outcomes occurred. So um, we have some worries about recall bias. Um, we had no data on maternal birth weight or any useful information on early life exposures that might be more clear, make more clear what's going on here. We had only limited data on um, early life SES for the mothers, and we used self-reported BMI and pregnancy variables. On the other hand, it's a 30-year follow-up of mothers at intergenerational cohort 
a national sample with large numbers, and enough racial ethnic adversi diversity to try to see how things work in different group, high risk groups. So um, for the future, we certainly need to, I think, continue with this work. I mean, we're cheered, not exactly cheered, that's not the right word, but we're glad to see that some of our hypothesis, that our hypothesis was worth funding. We have found an association between ACE and pre-pregnancy BMI. Um, I think that if you take our data and put it together with the rest of the data, there's still a green light to move ahead in asking these questions. Um, if we could, understand the pathways, and we could screen people, and we could develop effective interventions to prevent and treat ACE, it is highly possible that this could be a big contribution to managing weight with, for women before, during, and after pregnancy. And in the meantime, whether or not ACE is known to be a risk factor for obesity, um, it is certainly known to be a risk factor for other kinds of things, and there may be some value in, um, in in moving forward with assessing it and developing interventions. And if not, if people don't want to do ACE, at least they can emphasize good nutrition for women before, during, and after pregnancy. Thank you. So I have a, qu I have a question. Uh, one of the things that uh, has come out of a lot of the data on adults is that it's not about obesity. It's about chronic metabolic disease. And thin people can get it too. So my question is, do you have data or did you look at the risk for, say, type 2 diabetes as opposed to obesity in the, out, in the uh, cohort uh, that you followed the longest? We uh, will be looking at that, although I'm not sure that the quality of the outcome data, it's all self-reported. But we do have the opportunity to look at that, and we are looking at that. But we haven't looked at it yet. Any, uh, Alyssa? Yeah. So the, the question is the difference between stress and response to stress, and whether or not response to stress might play a bigger role. Um, we have some psychosocial data uh, measured early. Um, I think we have, I can't remember which one we're going to be using. Is it self-efficacy? I think it's, we have some data on self-efficacy. We have midlife depression, uh, but we, it is an ideal. It doesn't have a battery of questions that I'm sure other studies might, uh, but we are looking at that. And we are hoping to interact um, love with these variables, which would be another maybe way of getting at perception of resilience or something like that. Yeah. We have one minute. Um, well, I don't, th I don't think it matters. We could go, I don't, Lorraine, did we look at the 85th? We just went with the, we went with the highest cutoff. Um, yeah, I, I'm telling you, we looked at everywhere we could. We couldn't find, we looked at standard deviation changes, we looked at percent changes. I mean, we really looked. We wanted to make sure we weren't missing something. 85th percentile. Yeah, they used the 85th percentile. Yeah. All right, well, thanks for sticking it out the whole morning. Lunch is served.